Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm your host with the most, the one and only, and lately we've been on a Mac mini video spree because there's really a lot to unpack with this tiny new computer now featuring the improved M2 chip. But the real question is, just how much better is it versus the prior M1 chip? If you can recall, when the M1 chip initially came out, it blew people away with its immense power. So needless to say, the M2 has a lot to live up to. Many people with any M1 Mac may be on the fence on whether they should upgrade or not, specifically those with an M1 Mac Mini like myself. But rest assured, you've come to the right place. I already unboxed and gave a quick recap of everything that's new with the Mac Mini. So in today's video, we're not going to make it any longer than we need to and get right into some testing to determine whether or not I believe this is a worthy upgrade or not. Check out the video description for my M2 Mac Mini unboxing video as well as checking out some of those affiliate links where you can save some cash on the prior M1 Mac Mini alongside some really nifty accessories and peripherals that pair up well with the Mini. Also, stay tuned as after this video, I'll also be testing the M2 versus the M2 Pro variant of the Mac Mini head to head and only way to not miss out is by clicking that subscribe button down below. Lastly, make sure to stay hydrated y'all, it's very important and if you haven't chugged some water yet, do me and yourself a solid and go and do that right now. And so now, without further ado, let's go ahead and roll that intro. Alright, alright ladies and gentlemen and tech nerds from around the world, let's begin. Not only will we be going over some raw benchmarks, but also some real world testing with Final Cut Pro and Adobe Lightroom to determine if those precious seconds saved are worth it or not. So as is customary, let's begin with Geekbench. Geekbench is a pretty reliable barometer of getting a good idea at what you can expect out of your machine. It's used by many, many tech reviewers and tech enthusiasts alike and is one of the most reliable tests to run when comparing computers potential power under the hood. So first, we ran a simple single core and multi core test on both the M1 Mac Mini and the M2 Mac Mini. Thankfully, the differences here are actually pretty reasonable. The M1 Mac Mini comes in with a single core score of 1744 and a multi core score of 7557. But the M2 Mac Mini proves that it's a worthy upgrade to its predecessor as it comes in with a hot 1946 for single and 8959 on multi core. So already this indicates roughly a 12% increase in single core potential and about a 19% increase to multi core. This in and of itself is great news for those multitaskers like myself who regularly have multiple professional applications open at one time, such as Logic Pro, Final Cut Pro, Thinkorswim's technical analysis platform, Adobe Photoshop, and of course, multiple Chrome tabs. But what about in the graphics department? Running a metal test and an OpenCL test can give us a better idea of how big the upgrade is within the graphics department. According to my testing, when I ran an OpenCL, the prior M1 Mac Mini scored 19,647 for OpenCL and a pretty impressive increase to 27,359 on the M2 Mac Mini. Likewise, running Geekbench's metal test yielded a score of 22,068 for the M1 Mac Mini and 30,408 on the M2 Mac Mini, again representing an increase of well over 25% in the graphics department, a pretty respectable leap forward. But okay, now let's over to Cinebench R23, a test notorious for really maxing out your computer chip's potential. The way I see Cinebench is like running a 5K at the gym's treadmill and then immediately hopping off and going for some personal records on bench. On most MacBooks, this is the test that almost immediately starts to crank up those fans. But on desktops, and especially on a chassis like the Mac Mini, with great airflow and cooling, it's way more subtle. Anyway, here we again see decent improvements across the board with the M1 Mac Mini scoring 1512 on single core and 7703 on multi. The M2 Mac Mini, however, again decides to flex its new tech steroids as it comes in with a single core score of 1641 and 8509 on multi-core. 
On Cinebench, this represents an increase of roughly 10% for both single and multi-core, which is in line with the results we got from the Geekbench test, excluding graphical horsepower. Okay, so already some basic assumptions can be made, and that is, with the regular mundane tasks, the increase of 10% is kind of meh. Like, I mean, it's okay, but those numbers certainly aren't upgrade worthy. However, I wanted to do a little more digging at the graphical improvements given that Geekbench Metal and OpenCL yielded improvements of over 25%, which is noteworthy. I think most of us know very well that Macs are not the go-to computers for gamers. But what you'll see is that Apple made huge improvements to the graphics department with the new M2, and I'm now very curious to see how the M2 Pro will perform. So now, let's head over to Unigen's Heaven benchmarking test. Here, we ran a benchmark on the Ultra setting to really max out the GPU cores, but already, when running Unigen's Heaven test on the M1 Mac Mini, man, you can clearly see the dropped frames. Even though the M1 was critically acclaimed for changing the PC chip game, now looking at it running this test in 2023, all I can say is one word. Sheesh! It sucks. So look, the M1 Mac Mini averaged just 13.9 frames per second, making it grotesquely not suitable for gaming. Like, any gamer will tell you that playing a game at 13.9 frames per second is god awful. The M2 does make some improvements though, but it's still pretty crappy. It averaged 20.7 frames per second, indicating roughly a 50% increase based off this test alone. Not bad. These are the kinds of gains you want to look for when upgrading chipsets from one gen to the next. And by the way, Unigen's Heaven Test also spits out a raw score. So on the M1, that score came in at 351, while the M2 massively outperforms it with a score of 521. But again, looking at the bigger picture, the M2 score is pathetic when compared to other gaming desktop computers. Hmm. So far we have some interesting results. It seems that the single and multi-core performance is only marginally better and it seems graphical horsepower is much improved. Let's do some more testing though. Heading over to Blender. The Blender benchmark test is more of an amalgam of what a computer chip comprises and does a pretty decent job at benchmarking the potential performance under the hood that encompasses just about everything. So here, this test runs three different applications that you first must download and then runs all three and spits out how many samples that certain scene can produce per second. The three tests are named The Monster, Junk Shop, and Classroom Test, again sampling many many scenes all at once. Here are the results on screen right now, and as you can see, the improvements are in line with an S upgrade. Like, they are improvements, but only slight improvements. Again, I think we can pick up a common theme here. Slight improvements that are only noticeable if you're actually looking for them. But it seems that on a day-to-day real-life usage basis, the improvements here from the M1 to the M2 are slight, but they are present. Okay, and now finally, this will be the last test for raw benchmarks, specifically in regards to graphics, because once again, that seems to be the predominant improvement here. For this final benchmark, we cranked up the GFX Metal Test, which showcases a variety of scenes and captures the frames per second of each scene, which can lead to speculation as to how well a chip's graphics should perform in the real world, specifically in regards to gaming. Traditionally on GFX on my channel, I run four different scenes, the Aztec Ruins, Car Chase, Manhattan, and T-Rex simulations, and let them run to compare the power under the hood between both chips. As expected, the M2 chip does outperform the M1 chip, but by slim margins. Here, take a look at the graphs and see for yourself. The biggest improvements came from the most graphically intensive scenes, which in this case happens to be the Aztec Ruins and Car Chase scenes. The proof is in the M2's porridge as the saying goes. You make your own conclusions to determine whether these differences in power are worth it for you. It's clear that the M2 chip does perform better graphics wise, but is it enough of an improvement to justify the upgrade? Okay, but raw benchmarks are one thing. What about real world testing? As a video creator, time is money, and the faster your computer can crank out, render, and export a video, the better. 
especially in modern time where short instant content is preferred and at a much higher volume. So I went over to my video editing software of choice, which is Final Cut Pro on Mac machines. I did some very light but identical edits on a 10 minute clip and then exported both videos using the same exact compressor settings. So how much faster is the M2 chip for video editors? Short answer, a decent improvement, I'm not gonna lie. As you can see, the M1 chip exported the 10 minute clip in just under 3 minutes and 45 seconds, whereas the M2 chip was able to export it considerably faster, exporting it more than a minute faster coming in with a time of 2 minutes and 25 seconds. This doesn't sound like a lot, I know, but remember that this was only a 10 minute clip with minimal edits. I know plenty of people that work with 30 minute projects, 60 minute projects, sometimes even exceeding 2 hours, and with longer projects, you can expect the time to start to compound considerably quicker. Alright, that's video editing, but what about my photographers out there? It's not uncommon to take upwards of 500 shots in a single 30 minute or 60 minute photo shoot. So for this real world test, I made identical edits to every single photo and then exported all 249 JPEGs. Kinda wish that number was rounded to an even and pretty 250, but whatever. The thing is, when exporting them using their original and default settings, the time difference were within the margin of error, and honestly, pretty negligible. The M1 was able to export the 249 photographs in 1 minute and 44 seconds, while the M2 Mac Mini exported them only 3 seconds faster, coming in with a time of 1 minute and 41 seconds. So you tell me. Is 3 seconds worth the upgrade if you're a photographer? Okay, and finally, before we conclude and I give you my final thoughts, I did want to cover the topic of the SSDs, because it seems that there's a bit of a controversy with the base starting storage of the M2 chip. So here's the thing, my M1 Mac Mini has a 1TB SSD, and it's long been known that Apple tends to cheap out with the base models, especially the base starting storages. And well, my testing does not lie. As you can see from Blackmagic's disk retest, the M1 Mac Mini with the 1TB SSD hovers around 2950 on read and 3000 megabytes per second on write. Some pretty impressive numbers if you ask me. However, once we crank up the Blackmagic disk retest on the M2 Mac Mini with the base 256GB SSD, things aren't as pretty. Take a look for yourself, the M2 Mac Mini hovers roughly around 1500 megs per second on read and just 1400 megs per second on write speeds, leading to a huge disparity in SSD speeds. If you happen to transfer large projects onto your SSD from an SD card or something, you can expect the base model M2 Mac Mini to perform significantly slower than the M1 Mac Mini with an upgraded SSD. This has been a topic of discussion for many years now, as Apple simply is using cheaper components is what it seems like on the baseline starting storage versus the upgraded storage models, essentially forcing you to fork up more money if you want a speedier and snappier SSD, which in my opinion is pretty messed up. I think most people don't know this, and most individuals simply assume that SSD speeds should perform the same regardless of storage capacity, but clearly that isn't the case. Stay tuned for the M2 Pro comparison, which happens to have a starting base storage of 512 gigabytes versus 256 for the regular M2 chip. I wonder if the M2 Pro chip will be significantly faster than the base M2 model. My guess is, it probably certainly will. So guys, there you have it, a combination of some raw benchmarks and some real world testing. My verdict is simple. I don't think upgrading from an M1 Mac Mini to an M2 Mac Mini is a wise choice. Sure, the improvements to graphical horsepower are present, but unless you really need the extra GPU power for gaming or video editing, I say either skip this or look into the M2 Pro variant of the Mac Mini. And you can bet that I'll have a similar head-to-head -head comparison with the M2 and the M2 Pro Mac Mini so you can come to a better conclusion yourself. You know how we do it on this channel. I like to be very transparent and simply present the facts to you all so that ultimately you can come to your own conclusions. So for me, I do not plan to upgrade my M1 Mac Mini anytime soon, not until the M3 Pro next year or whatever they plan to call it. For now, if you have an M1 Mac, I think you'll be fine for plenty more years to come to be honest. 
only upgrade if your job or business depends on it where every minute is crucial to your productivity. In that case, I would highly advise you consider the M2 Pro option, but I guess for now, you'll have to stay tuned for that head-to-head -head comparison to see how it fares versus this standard M2 Mac Mini. That's been it for me, guys. If you learned something or happen to find this video useful, don't forget to drop a like. And with that, I'm clocking out for now, but I cannot wait to catch you all in my next video.